I am Kelly Taxter, the Barnett and Anna Lee Newman Curator of Contemporary Art at the Jewish Museum. And I'm here with Lori Simmons, artist, filmmaker, photographer. She's joining us from Connecticut. I'm somewhere in upstate New York. Um, and Lori, you're in your studio now, which uh, has been the place where you've been doing most of your work. Um, and we thought we would talk about you know, the history of masking that you've used throughout your whole career, practically, um, and kind of using that as a way to kind of think about what you've done in the past and how maybe cultural circumstances, context contextual circumstances now have maybe even changed your thinking about that as time has worn on and here we are. Well, Masks are certainly the locus of a lot of um, uh, political strife right now and tension. I mean, I've been thinking about masking and masks for as long as I can remember in my work. And it's interesting because the times that I've been in New York, the thing that makes me the saddest is to see people on the street in masks. And I have such a history of dressing people in them, thinking about them and using them in some way. And yet that seems to be um, something that I find very, a very difficult aspect of all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the forced mask, I guess. I mean, I think one of the things that is poignant about what you've done, especially the last couple of series, is it's the, the the masking and the painting is a way to kind of um, embody another self or transcend the self in some way. Whereas the masking we're seeing now is containment and negative, right? So it, it's protective and it's yeah. positive. And there's, um, there seem to be issues. Like I say, it's, it's the locus of a lot of hostility and um, political unrest and it's become a symbol um it's it's almost become a part a partisan symbol not everywhere obviously people have a great deal of common sense but you know those really powerful pictures in the press with a a person with a mask facing off with a person without a mask really close those are really powerful images right now and mm -hmm. you know of course as somebody who's been making images for so many years i'm trying to understand what images will stay with us from this period of time? What will the most powerful images be? And certainly, right. um, certainly that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah, there are those, um, those images of the, hold on, turning this off. The mask face off, so to speak, but then there's also been like that group anonymous who used masks to protect themselves while they were protesting. You know, there's this like, there's always been this kind of funny um, partisanship, if you want to call it that, or even when, um, you know, you would see people from Asia that wore, that where the mask is totally common and it's a sign of respect, like you don't want to be be hurting or harming or infecting others so you wear the mask where when you see that it was like a joke in the beginning that, that you would do that was like it seems so out of place um but i guess maybe you know what we could do is kind of think about how you've used masking maybe starting with some of the images in the studio and um yeah someone said the gorilla girls of course the gorilla girls yeah, um, such a great one. I know. Yeah, it's just such, to such powerful effect. Mm -hmm. really powerful. Yeah. Um, I I wonder if I carry my phone around. You think I'll make viewers super dizzy? Well, maybe they'll let us know if you do. I don't think so. Let me know because I've been I was practicing and I was told to just go really slowly. Otherwise, you get yeah. Dizzy. But first, we well, where would you? Where would you like to start? I'd like to start um, with, this is one of the first photographs I ever made. And it was a pair of uh, twin Lone Rangers. These were toys that belonged to my 
then boyfriend, who is now my husband, he <laughs> called them the big figures and he played with them when he was little. And after I did a whole series of uh, dollhouse pictures, he gave them to me and said, maybe you can do something with these. So I took them out in the grass. I remember really clearly it was February 1979 because I had a new white, very cool ski jacket and I lay down in the mud and that was that for the ski jacket. But this entire series of photos, there were about um, 20, which I showed at PS1 in 1979, were shot in one afternoon lying in the muddy grass in, um, in Southern Connecticut. So I remember being really intrigued by these guys and the fact that, um, that they were masked and then thinking about the Lone Ranger and how what a, a sort of powerful and enchanting figure he was when I was a kid. Um, if I could move over here, this is a really recent mask mm. uh, that turns up. This is a Kigurumi mask and it's made by um, a kid. I don't know if it's male or female, but it was a cosplayer in somewhere in Russia that we found online and he created wow. masks for us. And it looks, it looks so creepy sitting on the table, but here are a couple of the images that we made. We got about um, three or four of these masks and we would pay for them online. I don't know if it was through Etsy, but I never knew if the mask was really going to arrive. It was always <laughs> super mysterious. We would wait and say, well, is this one going to come? Is this one actually going to come? And we still know nothing. I mean, we love our mask maker, but we still know nothing about him or her. And is the it's, reason why they didn't reveal their, I mean, was there kind of lack of identity part of the, the cosplay world that you were able to just kind of give these masks and sell these masks without having to be a person behind them? Well, no, we just, the communication was really difficult. <laughs> just weird. Yeah, it yeah, was just weird. Yeah, and it yeah. was just such an act of, I'm going to move really slowly over to more of the, this, this series was called Kigurumi, and it really was about these cosplay dollars. And, um, you know, people would go out, people would go out in their masks. I mean, this happened all over the world, but a lot, obviously, what happened in Japan. But you would kind of go out in your mask and you can see the eyes are sort of semi-transparent. I put the mask on a couple of times. It's not my thing, but the yeah. people that posed for me really loved wearing it. But, you know, people would go as their, you know, as their avatars, as, as dollars, and they would go to um, shopping centers and clubs, you know, parties. And you kind of need to be led around because it's sort of, you can't really see clearly through the mask, which is amazing. Okay. Try yeah, that part is so to make... creepy to me, actually, that you have to have that, like, that someone has to actually help you is very bizarre. Well, it's... It, that it there's this, of... like, sub-dom relationship with them, almost. Yeah, and it kind of puts you in this sort of... And I, it kind of puts you in this, this, um, this relationship, this very passive relationship to the person leading you around. Correct. Probably, yeah. I mean, when I saw these characters, I thought, oh, my God, if I had found these dollars when I started doing my work, I probably would have finished it all by the early 1980s. <laughs> they seem like the perfect fusion between um, dolls and humans. And of course, when my models wore these masks, it was like having a doll, but being able to say, stand up, turn around. Oops, wrong series here. Um, and I, you right. know, the people that wore the masks, the people that modeled for me tended to stay in the same mask and they really got into their identities. And, um, we would have very long shoot days. And often when they unmasked at the end of the day, I was really disappointed to see the human. And I really missed the interaction with, with, um, the dollar, with the masker. Right. So, well, it created, I mean, I think in, you've said a couple of times when we were talking that there was like this kind of, that they, they had this, that interstitial thing, you know, that there was yes, exactly half human, half inanimate. And there was like a different level of connection, presumably, because that you could speak and they could react to how you were giving them direction. So it's also this, I always liked how there was this funny relationship between you, the photographer and the subject 
and the subject being somewhat blind, you know, that this, yeah. this idea of faith in you and then like the long, you know, the history of the male photographer and the male photographer and the female model, that this kind of being this other dynamic. And then also, which kind of took gender out of it because the, the doll is just, what is it? It's gender, you know, again, they're, right. they're becoming characters. They're not embodying a gender per se, they're embodying a thing. Um, yeah. Um, I kind of flipped back in time here to um, the late 80s and early 90s when I was working with a lot of ventriloquist dummies, and mm. um, which is another kind of masking. It, was, it seemed like my working with ventriloquist dummies sort of paired with a kind of, I would say, my second wave or third wave political awakening when I understood, when I started to really understand truth and lies um, in nature. Um, but I thought it was really interesting. This is um, this is a still from from a series called The Music of Regret, which later became my animated film, The Music of Regret, a puppet movie. But I've been ordering masks like crazy because I want to support um, young designers who have turned to mask making, and I send sure. them to my children. I'm in a situation where I don't need to be masked, but. It's, I just go online, I go on Etsy, and I found this one, and I thought, okay, here oh we go. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. Life <laughs> definitely imitating art here. Oh my God. Um, Has anyone yeah, asked got, you to make one yet? Yes. I don't have of an course. image of it. Yes. In oh, fact, we need to get that. They want to use the images from um, my show at the Jewish Museum. So, oh, incredible! I don't have an image of it, but yeah, I, I'm really excited to to do that. But speaking of, just because we're close by, Aha. Um, here's one Old of the friends. images um, from that show. Um, so, I mean, you were the curator. You, yeah. you can talk a little bit about it. So <laughs> So that was one of the first shows I did when I got to the museum, actually. Um, when did it open? February 2015. Is that right? And I thought it was 2014. I 2014? Don't know. Let's see. Yeah, I, 2014, 2015? Must, yeah, it must have been 2014. Um, it was called How We See. And it was a single gallery exhibition. And you showed six images? Yeah, I think right? so. Mm -hmm. And they were these very large scale, as we're seeing, um, portraits from the sort of chest up, like almost like a high school graduation photo or high school yearbook photo. Um, and they all had these luminous colored backdrops, like a kind of satin curtain idea. And each sitter was painted so that their, their eyes were closed and then you had their eyes painted over painted onto their eyelids. So they had these incredibly uncanny staring um, looks to them. And Ooh. say hi to Penny. Hi Penny. Oh, hi Penny. Penny's here. I grew um. up with Collies. Um, and it was such a strange group. I mean, they all kind of, we positioned them so they were all kind of looking at or away from each other or you when you were in the room. And it, you know, they, it was it was a really uncanny, strange thing, as I said. Um, you know, and again, it, it, uh, whoops, it's an idea that I got from kind of going deep down the rabbit hole of makeup tutorials and dollars and kikurumi on the internet. And I could just, I could just spend hours watching makeup tutorials and watching <laughs> young women paint their eyes like anime paint anime eyes on themselves. And one of the things I loved about the series was that I could invite in other artists. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, Landy Dean or James Caliardos, the artists that painted the eyes who are makeup artists, yes, but they're also phenomenal artists who are able to render, who are able to render, you know, their palette being the human face. Um, and you also worked with designer, like you had really particular clothing that, you know, the clothing yeah. also had small drawing on it. And well, this was a Rachel, Rachel Antonoff uh, mm -hmm. blouse. And I'm, I apologize, but I'm suddenly forgetting the name of um, the artist, the illustrator. I'm so sorry. And I will remember it and put it up at some point who did the drawings. Did for I, have it? I think we yeah. had it. 
back at that time, but. Um, I'm looking at my text, I don't see it. But regardless, you, it was like this kind of collaborative effort and it came out of this really specific culture as well. So you had, right before this, you had the Kigurumi and this was the like other kind of extension of this dollars thing. Right, where people exactly. would do this as another kind of masking as a way to kind of inhabit this other look or character or whatever. Um, and this kind of transforming of the human body then started to take off on its own. Oh my God, I've not, oh wow, that one's incredible. That's a sneak peek at something new. Um, oh wow. Um, but I'm trying to move up to back in 20, 2009, 10, when I was working with Love Dolls which culminated in taking a love doll, which, you know, it's called a love doll. It's basically a sex doll. But um, I was so fascinated the times that I went to Japan. I'm so fascinated with geisha culture and Maiko culture and that kind of masking. I mean, I actually hired people to paint, uh, to paint the dolls and I could actually watch the way geisha makeup was done. Mm. And it's, it's amazing. And that, you know, to say that that's anything other than a mask, you know, that's what it is. I mean, it's in incredibly um, time consuming and painstaking and really, truly so much more than makeup. Yeah, no, it's a complete inhabiting of this other character. I mean, it's, I mean, the masking for performance or for, you know, switching that identity to be somebody else is, has a long history in every single culture, pretty much. Um, mm -hmm as we know. And I discovered the first mask looks like a smiley face. It's so crazy. It's, I showed it oh, to you. Oh, can that, you show that? Do you have I it? Wonder, I wonder if, I can, if you can see it on my computer because it's really wild. It's from 7,000 BC and it's just stone. Let's see, I'm pulling it up on my computer and I'll make it really big. There it is. That's amazing. It's kooky, and that. So anyway, <laughs> someone wore that some someplace somewhere. Yeah. Um, it's actually in a in a. Bib, wait, what museum? It's in a really interesting museum. The the, the Musée Bible, and I don't know. It's in a some kind of religious museum in France. Um, but anyway, I digress. It was mostly just to say that this, 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 this tradition has been around for as long as people have been around. They've been kind of right. taking their face and doing something else with it. Well, it has so much to do. I mean, in, in, you know, in the case of my interest, it has so much to do with both transformation and artifice mm -hmm. and melodrama and all of the things that, um, all of the things that, that I need to keep me interested in, in, in making work, you know? And also this idea that I remember so well that you like your interest in photography is not for truth telling, but to lie. So, yeah, it seems you know, so simple and it mm -hmm. kind of seems so simplistic and naive. But at the point here, we'll move along here at the point where I did. Um, OK, at the point where I did start to take photos. Um, there were a lot of people out on the street. Um, there were a lot of people looking for the decisive moment. There was a different kind of photography that was being foregrounded, particularly like at the museums, like at the Museum of Modern Art. And I had this feeling like I was supposed to be that. Right. But I wasn't that. So I was sort of hiding away in my studio, creating my own reality and understanding that I could do, there could be a lot of ambiguity in what I was doing. Okay, we're going to go back where I can, this is my studio. It's um, very sunny. Yes, it's a nice day. Okay, I'm gonna flip again. Okay. If it works. Okay, back. Yeah. Well, who would have wanted to have been out on the street taking photos in the 70s in New York anyway, right? I don't know if, would you have don't even been able to no, but as a, like a young woman, it's dangerous, no? Well, I had friends that were definitely doing it, but I think that I was, you know, I was both very brave and also very timid. And I think, honestly, I would tell myself that I didn't want my camera to get ripped off. Mm -hmm. But I think that I just wasn't 
finding enough. I wasn't finding enough that I wanted to see when I walked around. I also was shy and self-conscious. So if I did see something, I, and I still feel that way. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes I'll see something and I really want to snap a picture with my iPhone and I'm just like, I don't know if I can be that person. I don't know if I can invade that person's space. So right. that does not make for a uh, street photographer. That's, that's not, <laughs> yeah. that's not a good way to approach the material. So. But that obviously lends itself to what you did end up doing with making these little interiors that were the sort of beginnings right. of everything. And this idea of like perfection or... I mean, I think your work gets construed a lot with, you know, feminist ideologies and like ideas about women and the domestic, but there's this other thing going on, which is more about like this um, memory place that you have, or this idea of this kind of airless, perfect vision or perfect still life of something that you couldn't have or some kind of unattainable image or memory or... Airless is such a good word. And I, I think that um, that a lot of that first work was about the contradiction that I saw when I was growing up about the way things were supposed to look and the way they really looked like time, um, Life Magazine versus real life, American TV in the 50s and 60s versus real life. And it's interesting because the first time my work got written about, um, which was January of 1979, I remember it so well. It was uh, an article by Ben Lifson in the Village Voice called Robert Frank and the Track of Life. And it was about Robert Frank, but it was about me and Dawood Bay. And he talked about my work as a feminist critique, you know, like a critique of the housewife trapped in her home. And that's not what I, that's not what I was doing, but I was so excited to get written about this. Okay, I'll take it. I'm a feminist yeah, sure. artist. Yeah. And I was, you know, there, there's no way that I wasn't, you know, part of a very right. strong second wave feminism, but that wasn't my, um, that wasn't the way I saw my work. Um, right. It wasn't the impetus for the thing. It was the effect of the thing, which is. Yeah. But it kind of started a, 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 a counter narrative or an alternative narrative to the one that I, I was putting out. And of course, I was putting out my own narrative very, very reluctantly, very shyly, because um, I, I really was excited about making art. But then when I realized I had to talk about it, I kind of froze. You know, I really froze. And interestingly, I remember being on the first panel I was ever on, which I think was in Philadelphia. Um, and I remember trying to talk about my early in interiors, my early color interiors, like they were abstractions. Mm. And I remember, I, re I still remember looking at the audience. It was very, um, a very intellectual audience. And I still remember all of those puzzled faces because I was showing slides of those small interiors and saying, you know, these are really abstractions, <laughs> but... <laughs> Well, they were, they're sort of like memory scapes too. I mean, I always think about things when they, like, if you scale things down, it's almost like when you look at a photograph, and this is why there's also something interesting about the large scale of the, the more portrait-based work that you're doing now. When you, when you shrink everything down and look at it like some kind of old nostalgic snapshot, it's very easy to think of things almost like you're looking at them from above, like you're looking at a little dollhouse. You know, there's like this memory um factor that goes into it that is very odd you know that distance that kind of bird's eye view thing is um well condensing the space also made me think about indian miniatures and all of this you know this tradition or oh wow even, yeah even you know when i was an art student and i saw um paintings in chapels when i saw giotto when i saw the way things were were painted and the, um, the perspective was so squished. And I felt like, um, I felt like just by moving my camera around these little sets, I could do that. If I can jump up, I have a little book over there that I can, I have more visual material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's that, there's like this trompe l'oeil thing that was, ha that sort of happens, right? Which is also happening now in the work with the painting on the body, you know? This yeah, I, yeah. 
that's that stuff's really exciting to me but um i mean these are examples of like the very very first um this is yeah a tiny little book called in and around the house that later morphed into a bigger book called in and around the house but um we I'm, have three of those i think at the museum we have a whole little group of those yeah but like my really favorite thing was always the bathrooms. Yeah. I still love a good bathroom. And I yeah, the way the light is to, to shoot this. I had no intention of going this far back in time, but <laughs> um, I still love the fact that I could take this set and just find so much, you know, find so much, have such a good time with this little set. Yeah. But the crazy thing is, at the time, I thought um, that maybe it was ambiguous. I had seen, um, I had seen the photographs that documented Gordon Mata Clark's work when he saw the buildings in half, and he'd taken these black and white photographs where the rooms were bifurcated, but they were sort of, you know, on the page they were kind of quartered, and I thought, um, I thought, you know what? My photographs of doll house interiors, I think people could mistake them for real places. Mm -hmm. And that was, that's how I was operating until I introduced a doll. I really thought that, um, I really thought that I could fool people. Right. And you wanted to. Yeah. I thought that was, yeah. that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> but that like persists, right? Like or, or what, how much of what is happening now, you know, with the, with the painted on eyes and now the painted on clothing. And I mean, how much are you playing around with that still? Or are you wanting people to kind of slowly discover the artifice in those photographs? Well, I think again, we get back to masking because um, I'm gonna um, take, a, take you again, um, flip. Let's see if we can flip. Um, This is a portrait um, I made of my daughter who, I let each of my children decide what character they wanted to be. And then I hired um, an amazing body painters to come and paint clothes on them. So I mean, it really is crazy. Well, I don't know how else to say this. She's really naked. I mean, <laughs> the whole idea of the emperor's new clothes and also the idea of masking again, um, this is one that I also particularly like. This is Hannah, a friend of mine called Hannah. And Hannah's entire outfit is painted on jeans, T-shirt. I mean, you can see, look at this, the tear in the knee. Mm -hmm. And that's incredible. I mean, that one really, it, that one has a it, something about the way the jean is painted on. And it like has this kind of like superhero that's, I, I don't know. That one is particularly yeah. striking. I love this one. This one is much more um, kind of comedic and cartoony. Mm -hmm. This one is Hayden. Um, Especially the collar on that one is so crazy. It looks yeah. like, also looks like fondant, you know, like. Um, yeah, like cake icing. Like I mean. cake. Um, and I really love this detail, embarrassing mm -hmm. as it might be, but there's armpit hair, which is just such a <laughs> fantastic, <laughs> wonderful, Fool me once, don't fool me twice detail. Um, but I want to get back to the idea of scale with these things because I'm really trying hard not to make people dizzy here. But um, No, it's it's totally fine. And there's no, I'm not dizzy. Well, I mean, I'm not dizzy. So I bet we're all seeing the same thing. I have to go back really far. But this is, um, this is, this is my son, Cyrus. Um, the photo is called Grace. Um, and Cyrus chose the character of Rudolph Valentino, which was a really amazing choice for Cyrus to make because Rudolph Valentino was a, you know, was a heartthrob, was a huge star. He was, you know, women were in love with him, but for the time he was actually very, in a way, he was sort of between genders. I mean, he was very beautiful and very female looking mm -hmm. at times. And, you know, totally. it's and at the time, 
he, you know, he was no John Wayne, let's just put it that way. No, absolutely. No, um, he, like graceful and po like pointy features and. Right, right. And um, I, I really love this photo because um, it, it's just about a very, very specific time in Cyrus's life and a specific time in, in my life. And somebody, I can see someone is writing A Year Without a Name. Yeah. That's the book that Cyrus Dunham wrote about his transition. So I can see someone brought it up. So give me yep. a little plug. Also, Cyrus's um, gaze and the way that the face, like Cyrus's face in that image is so, um, it's really powerful, actually. Yeah, there were a lot, there were really a lot to choose from. Um, you know, sometimes it's so interesting. I think I love editing. It's one of my favorite parts of the whole process of, of shooting because the hard work is done and then you just get to look at pictures. And um, I kind of honed my skills in the early 80s when um, I was hired to edit covers for Glamour magazine by then, then art director, Paula Greif. Mm -hmm. And I had to just look at thousands and thousands of cover images, which at first looked, all the models looked the same to me but eventually I felt like I really understood the differences and the, these very minute differences and I understood what would make a powerful cover. And I feel like I took that experience, um, however many months I, I did that or a year, whatever, and really have grown to love the whole process of finding the one that you know, finding the one that you know is right. Not that I can't go back years later and say, oops, this one's okay too, or I made a mistake, but it's that knowledge when you're scrolling through things now, or I used to just look through slides of knowing which one, which image is the one. Mm -hmm. Oh, so. Are you flip? Oh, you're, oh, it's nice for you. Oh, are you there? Ooh. I'm here, I'm there? trying to okay. flip it. Okay, cool. <laughs> It's a lot so, of work. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. So was the the move to work with people? I mean, did that really did that transition really happen in full force after you made my art, the film? Did that really feel like the next logical place to go from the doll, like the full dolls, the full masking? You know, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's probably probably true. I mean, I I feel like. Um, like the entire history of my work has sort of been about like shooting dolls, puppets, cutouts, and then trying again to shoot a person, feeling like I failed and then going through the whole process again. I mean, there was that period of time when I shot underwater and those were real people. Um, there, were, there were different phases where I would try to use real people, but I feel like until I found the Kigurumi masks. I never got that sort of, you know, I never found that, you, you call it the interstitial place between doll and human mm -hmm. animate and inanimate, but I never found that happy spot of, of where it would work for me. So I, you know, if I had to just say what I have to do, I think that, um, and this isn't just me, you know, I, I observe this when I teach, I observe this in other people's work, sometimes we just have a really powerful desire to interrupt our own work in some way, like not just to find a picture, but to um, interrupt that picture, batter that picture, destroy that picture, do something to claim it and own it. And I feel like that's what I end up doing, you know, by painting or cutting or, you know, whatever the thing is that, that well, I- Well, there's so much, um... There's so much process in the work, you know, like, I wonder if part of why some of those other attempts to work with people didn't feel right is there just there wasn't enough intervention on your part where yeah. it seems like there's before you take this picture, you've worked for hours on the, you know, it's like when I was at art school, we had this class making a picture, not taking a picture, you know, that there it was just it was about everything that went into like the entire process that led up to finally you know, that, you know, that labor, that immersion into whatever your subject is or what your subject used to be in transforming that subject seems just as important as 
you know, yeah, the, the photograph or that's a great name for a course, by the way. <laughs> it was a good class. Yeah, I think it was. Do you know this? I don't know if anyone knows. It's Sandy Stark. I think she was the she was the um, person that did that class. But great idea. You know, yeah, but it, I think the the conceit for that was they were working with a giant um, eight by ten. So anyway. Um, yeah, but I didn't, I never really thought about that in your work before that there's so much about like that moment before the picture happens that seems to be so essential. Well, it seems like, um, it, it seems like a lot of it, um, working the way I work, a lot of it happens in, you know, there's not the process. I've lived with a painter for so many years and I know that painters, need to be, they have to have a tactile connection to what they're working on. Mm -hmm. It's so different. And it's taken me so many years to really understand the difference between the way I work and the way either my husband who's a painter or my friends who are painters um, work. They need, um, they need physical contact. It's interesting because I, when I had my show at the MCA in Chicago, I sat next to Kerry James Marshall at a dinner and I really loved talking to him about painting. And I said, you know, every other word that he said was about how he needed to be in his studio and he wanted to be in his studio. And I said, you sound like a grumpy painter, just like my husband. And he said, we're painters. We really need to have that kind of um, physical contact with our work. And, I thought, wow, it's taken me this long to realize that I can absent myself from actually shooting or making something and still in some way be progressing, you know, in terms of my ideas or, or just, you know, figuring out, pre-visualizing what something's going to look like. And it used to get my husband really upset because I would say, I think I'm going to have some petty fours made at a bakery and take these little legs I found in Japan that are B-girl legs and stick them onto the cake <laughs> and put them against a pink background and take the picture. And then I would do exactly that. But when I described it, he was horrified that I would <laughs> bribe an entire picture and then make the picture that I pre-visualized because so much for him was in the, you know, the immediacy of working on that particular right. painting. Right, like moving from one part to the next part to the next part, having like a, yeah. I mean, this is Well, the different. element of surprise or change, you know, right. and, and for me, the surprise is, so what angle are you going to shoot the legs from? Or when is the light going to strike the face so that it actually looks like it's alive? I mean, that's the big, you know, you can take a plastic doll and put a light on it and work on it and work on it. And there's one second where it looks like it's alive. And um, that's what I'm looking for. But now you have the element of surprise of your sitter. I mean, you're like, you know, you've moved into this other realm of like working with people. So you have, you do have a, I mean, you have a level of control, but then you must have a level of like wanting whatever it is they're going to bring to that character to come out, right? Like, how do you coax yeah. out that, that character? How do you guys meet between what they want and what you want? Yeah. Um... Yeah, and I felt like, I, I think you touched on something before, that once I directed a movie and worked with real people and understood um, what it meant to wrest emotion from a human face, I always felt like, oh, I can get emotion from, you know, I can, I can draw emotion from, from an inanimate doll or object or mannequin. I can really find it. But I was really nervous to try to find it with a real person. I thought, I, I can't do that. And if I was ever asked to do a portrait or asked to do a commercial shoot to, um, if I was ever asked to, to, to do a portrait assignment for a magazine, I just declined and I said, I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do that. I right. can't, can't shoot real people. That's not what I can do. <laughs> no real people for Lori Simmons. No, we, don't, we don't do people. <laughs> Well, I mean, I guess when we when we chat when we chose to talk about math, we were also just like I said at the beginning, thinking about what's going on now. And you had said to me that now you see math. It's like that's the one thing that's really like so. 
aside from the good that they're doing, like seeing people in that guise or with that protective equipment on is like, it's kind of triggering you in a, in a bad way. Well, there's so much, I mean, and I'm determined, um, I'm determined to be more upbeat in this, <laughs> in our talk than I have been. I mean, I, I, I delivered cookies to a neighbor the other day, all wrapped up like in a, you know, springtime in a bow and he was there and I passed them to him socially distanced and handed him cookies. And then I started talking about um, the future of humankind and the pandemic. And I thought, don't, don't <laughs> deliver cookies and then talk about the end of the world. Um, That's yin yang. <laughs> um, but there, there is so much out there. There is so much sadness and so much anger and so much grief and so much, um, such a lack of leadership and um, people are so frightened. But, and there are a lot of images that we are seeing um, connected, you know, particularly um, to, you know, particularly with um, what's going on in hospitals and with frontline emergency people and nurses, et cetera. Um, but there's something about walking down the street of New, streets of New York, we're just seeing families and, you know, the masks are a very uh, stark reminder of what's happening. Yeah. They could, you can be lulled into thinking that things sort of look normal, smell normal, feel no normal until you, you know, until you see that everyone is in a mask, I think. Yeah, I wonder what, you know, how that will change your feelings around the practice of masking or even just the not being able to see this part of the face, you know, how that changes our ability to read each other and, you know, what? Well, it's, yeah, it's interesting, you know, when I was taking out the old pictures and thinking about the Lone Ranger covering his eyes and the history of that kind of mask and now we're covering the bottom yeah. of our faces, so. Right, because there's always been this thing that the eyes tell you something about someone's emotional, but I, I mean, to me, if I don't see, if I don't, you, you know, I have, I read mouths, I read like tension in someone's jaw or, you know, a smile, obviously, or a fake smile or how, you know, there's so much that goes on and um, yeah, it's totally strange well, in that way. I kind of want to see the whole face, basically. The whole face, yeah. Or you have to be led around by the hand and <laughs> explained what's going on. Right. Um, we don't have that much time left, so I wanted to ask you if there's anything that we haven't looked at in the studio there that you want to cover. Like the new sneak peek, what, what's, what's the new next? Oh, well that was, I, I, I think I left um, the screen on the half man, half woman, and that's a place I was really um, starting to explore. Since my work, I feel like since day one, my work has been, you know, simple subject heading, women in interior space, sub -tech, subtitle, gender, um, <laughs> gender stereotypes. And I, I think that, um, I think that, you know, there's so much happening in my own life, you know, having a, having a trans child and having um, so many new um, trans friends and being starting to understand that aspect of um, you know it's like just when you think that more more doors can't be open for more information you know if you if your eyes and ears are open you, there are just so many more corridors to go down to to you know to feed the to feed the hungry art animals so I think that I've been thinking a lot about um, gender and I had this sort of recovered memory of my sisters and I, one of our favorite costumes for Halloween and even if it wasn't Halloween, was to very painstakingly dress up as a half man, half woman. Mm. Um, slick our hair back, draw on a mustache, cut clothes in half and we would, we would do it. I wish I had pictures of it. We would do it really well um, and it's also it's also a very popular costume, like at the Halloween parade and yeah. in the village. It's nothing, you know, again, I don't invent these ideas. I just sort of recreate them through my own filtering system. 
So I've been kind of, um, should I take you on one more little tour? We're running yeah. out of time here. Okay. Yeah. Very hard to flip it. Hmm. Let's and we see. should mention, I don't know that we mentioned that for the How We See series that we should at the museum, you cast trans, two trans people for that. Right? I did. I did. Yeah. And it was just, I don't even remember how that really happened. So this is one of the things I've been working on. This is um, wow. actually the, the makeup artist who did some of the eyes is, is a very talented makeup artist called Landy Dean. And this was one of the... Um, one of the experiments. I mean, I'm something about being in isolation where I usually don't ever show what I'm sort of like working on or what's not, you know, what's not a confirmed photo, but I'm sort of mm. like, okay, why not? And that's um, sort of like Pete, that's a, that's, that's a beard and mustache on the right. Like that's yeah, painted on. He, he wow. agreed, no, he agreed to shave off half his beard. Ah. <laughs> and he worked on this for a really long time. And then um, more experiments, not finished photos, experiments. This is the one I showed before. This is the only one that's finished. And this is a makeup artist called Tara Carrara. And she's very, um, she's sort of one of my muses. Um, so and, just, and, is that Tara? Is that her? Uh, yeah, or yes, she did the makeup? Yes. Oh, wow. She did herself. Wow. And here she is again. Wow. Insane. And did you find her on, on Instagram or the internet or something? I found her through, um, well, I used Body of Art um, is the, is the, um, were the painters the that I worked with. Incredible, mm -hmm. really incredible. And Tara was um, involved with them. So, oh, here's Sharin. This was from some new, this is my um, yeah, I remember friend, that the artist, one. the shot. Yeah. And in this one, her necklace is painted. It's incredible. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty. I love also, I mean, like, there's like that, you know, it also, it's, it can, there's that whole kind of like kitsch culture, like, um, I don't know, like Burning Man, where you, like the whole body paint thing that is, right. is, is always such a kooky, crazy, um, kitschy. I mean, it, there's like also that, which is also like, I think, you know, I don't know what that means exactly, but I love how that's kind of embedded in this somehow. Yeah, well, it's a lot from, um, it's a lot from spending way too much time online. Totally, yeah. Um, so I don't know. Oh, here's my, here's one of the only straight up portraits I've ever made. And interestingly- That's a great one. Well, interestingly, when I had this in my exhibition, Many, many people asked me if Penny's eyes were painted, <laughs> which <laughs> I love the question because it means I'd set them up for that sort of illusion. But it would be really hard to spend two hours painting Penny's eyes. And keeping them closed. I mean, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's point. yeah. Yep. She'd have to be a very obedient so, colleague, of which there are many, but that would be exceptional. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be her. So wow. anyway, I think we're... I think we're coming to the end of our... Yeah, we have to wrap it up before Instagram session. kicks us off. Oh, is that what happened? Well, it's yeah, they basically, yeah, they shut you down. You get like a cut. Um, well, it's an incredible thing to have this view into your studio and see all these pictures on your wall and what you're working on. That's very generous. Thank you. No, um, it's just nice to, you know, have a window into someone's world right now. It's, I think it's what people need. Well, we need an excuse to um, wash our hair and put on yeah. lipstick. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I did wash mine this morning, I, I could... but I'm still in a t-shirt. I can't, I can't get to the next level, which is like putting on an outfit or something. That's not happening yet. But you don't have to, put, you know, you don't have to put on an outfit. You have to put on half an outfit. Like, half an outfit but I don't even have like proper like I don't have proper clothes here I just it's just mm -hmm. is what it is but that's okay I think I'm seeing any of these comments oh Ann Schaefer you know Ann Schaefer Lori hi <laughs> yeah she's there hi oh, Ann funny dipstick I see her Tommy caught so many friends oh Tommy yeah I just met him on a I just did a crit with him yeah oh, that's cool former student Oh, nice. 
All right. Well, we're. I just got my alert from um, Jenna, so I guess we should say goodbye. Thank you, Lori. That was really incredible. Yeah, it was really nice to move the phone around like that. Bye-bye. Yeah, you did great. Bye.